This is House Planning Help, episode 125. Hi there, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self built, because I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. Alongside this, I'm still trying to get my own project underway. I wanted to complete an energy efficient home before I turn 40 this coming August. So look at today's session. My guest is author of Hyperlocalization of Architecture. That's Andrew Mitchler. Lots in this episode today. I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, we centered it around how to create beautiful designs through constraints. Just a quick congratulations message, really, before we go into our interview. And that is to Wolfgang Feist and his team at the Passive House Institute, because at the time this podcast is launched, they're gearing up for the 20th International Passive House Conference. It's two decades, lots of information. It's returned to its home, which is the home of the Passive House Institute, Darmstadt, no doubt. Wolfgang might even be showing people around his house, one of the first passive houses to be built. So I imagine it's going to be great. I went last year, would love to go along. I think the content would be a little bit over my head as I found last year that it's obviously very technical as you would expect and want for the main people that are going there. For me, I think no, it's not too useful. However, I love meeting all of the people and it's very much a world conference. You do get that feeling, a lot of passion going on there. So hello to anyone who's off to the conference. And again, well done to everyone at the Passive House Institute for driving forwards all of the benefits that we come to know and love, the comfort, the energy efficiency and everything else that's with it. OK, let's get to the featured interview today with Andrew Mitchler, who is the author of Hyperlocalization of Architecture. Every so often we talk about the impacts of constraints on a project. And today we're going to make that a focus. However, you'll have to forgive me and give me the right to weave a little bit because Andrew's got many interesting things going on, as you're going to find out now. First up, I asked him to tell me a little bit about his background. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I live in uh, the Colorado uh, Rocky Mountains, and I've lived here for over 20 years off grid. And for most of that time, I was a builder and did some design work, and then I got into um uh, sustainable design early on and ended up uh, writing about that quite a bit for blogs and just completed a book as well, as well as uh, a passive house. So it's the first uh, certified international passive house in Colorado. Was it a choice to go off grid or was it just because of where you're located? Yeah, we, we live maybe a mile or a kilometer and a half from the power lines and it made sense financially and technically it was very early in the game. So it was an, I thought it was an interesting challenge to take on. What did you learn when you did it? Uh, energy efficiency is king. That was, that was the lesson is that making energy is not so hard, but storing it is really hard. And then uh, learning to consume it when you need it is the most vital design part. And we're probably going to come back around to your own project because I know that you're either building a second time. In fact, you must be. If you live in an off-grid house, what, where is your location? Have you moved? or No, it's actually the two places are right next to each other. It's really a guest house. Okay. The, pa the passive house is a guest house, even though it's slightly larger than my other house. As I said, I want to get to that in a little bit, but there's so much here that we can talk about today because we've called this episode How to Create Beautiful Design Through Restraints, but it comes on some of that interesting research for both your book. So what about the trip? Tell me about some of these places that you went to see. Yeah, so I, I traveled to about six regions around the world. I went to Japan and Spain, Australia, uh, Seattle area as well, and Germany. And I was looking for uh, the way that we're designing contemporary architecture around very uh, deep, sustainable goals in different places that did it very well. So if you can think about uh, in Japan, uh, the tiny house movement that's kind of a worldwide phenomenon, the Japanese have done an incredible job of integrating small uh, house design into uh, a genuine lifestyle. Did you get an invite to go to a certain place or had you been hunting this down on the internet? This came from a number of years of doing research work and writing. And after a time, I could recognize different types of designs. I could, I could recognize the place they're in almost by their design, even <laughs> if it was contemporary and very cutting edge. So I thought there was something to that. So I, the book is really investigation of uh, that phenomena. 
tiny houses, I'm a big fan of them, but what are your thoughts on what you saw in Japan and how they might compare to back in the States? Yeah, they're, they're actually two different things. And, and I think what we call tiny houses here, I actually call micro houses because they're smaller. They're, they're usually on wheels here. They're made to be put in backyards. Often for people who want to live like me, buy a piece of land out in the middle of nowhere and be off the grid. But what I found out, the reason why these Japanese houses are so, so successful is not only because of the, of the really brilliant design strategies, is also that they're deeply connected to neighborhoods. So functionally, just like in any city, the neighborhood becomes the living room, so to speak, for these families. I've always wondered that about tiny houses because you think that really if you have a tiny house, you're probably not going to want to spend as much time in that as if you had a bigger house. You know, that's absolutely true. But if you think about what you actually do in a house, you may actually not, especially out here in the US, uh, our houses can be phenomenally large for what we use them for. So much of these houses are underutilized in the first place. So in Japan or in cities, you're just, you're just using the commons as part of that space. Also, there's other principles, you know, I, uh, how people live together changes, of course, in a tiny house. How do you fit a four, family of four in, say, uh, 80 uh, square meters? So privacy becomes a different, that's partially cultural and just what we, how we uh, learn to live changes. You obviously enjoyed Japan. Was that the highlight or did you take some other lessons from those uh, other regions that you looked at? Australia was actually my highlight uh, simply because of the radical approaches they take towards architecture. They're certainly much more progressive or risk-taking oriented, especially in Melbourne. I just got back from Melbourne from uh, the Passive House Conference down there. And it was just really exciting to see how adaptive uh, they are uh, from a design point of view at trying new ideas, constantly uh, approaching the same old boring problems in very unique, vivid ways. Now, you probably can't say all of Australia there. I don't know how much you got out of of Melbourne, because I'm sure (laughs) having been to Melbourne, I know it's a very diverse city, but did you get to the outback? I didn't get to the outback, you know. but there's there's so much Australia is a really big place. Man. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's probably a bit like the the states and North America, and yeah, you've got a lot of ground to cover, haven't you? So fair play. I do have an outback house in in the book, though, which is just the sweetest little thing. It's a little cabin called permanent camp, camping, and it's so tiny that it it's really designed to be very lightly sitting on the land, and it catches the water and it changes. I call the chapter unfolds. Australian folds and it's how kinetic architecture affects how you can, how you can use kinetic gestures in buildings. And that building opens and closes during the season or if there's a brush fire coming through. So there, there's definitely some beautiful ideas about living out in the wilderness that, that we can look at. Of course, Australia have the great landscapes and very different climates as well. Does good architecture actually change almost as if it, as almost as when you go around the world? Uh, good architecture, you know, I, I say that there is no perfect building, that really the best that we can expect is a really good response to the conditions that the building is in. So those conditions can vary both culturally, uh, topologies, and uh, of course, climate and the use of the building. So every building is very unique in its own way, uh, just depending on what its needs are. So so there's great solutions everywhere, but There's also places where there's pockets of many, many great solutions together and that people are learning uh, very quickly from each other. I never forget when I first started out on my journey at House Planning Help and doing research, I was thinking to myself, what I'm going to do, I'm going to discover the ultimate house and then mass produce that. Because, of course, that will be brilliant, won't it? And looking back on it now, that was the stupidest thing ever and it just wouldn't work. But I guess in a way, that's sometimes the challenge that volume house builders, if they ever had enough money to play with, I know they're always <laughs> trying to extract money out of the projects, but that's that would be what their challenge is, I guess. Their, yeah, their challenge has been, of course, well, it's to them, it's not really a challenge. They just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> Something to sell. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, they expect you to live within their very prescribed and generic conditions. And uh, especially if you're building your own house, that's the perfect opportunity to go outside of those pre-prescribed 
ideas of what a house is and explore different ideas that fit your idea of living. I know that when we were chatting before, I'm probably going to phrase this really badly, but you said something really interesting to me about a good architect when they approach a building, almost three quarters of it is designed straight away. How did I do, first of all? Is that nonsense or (laughs) is that a good paraphrase? I I think that's it's a close to the paraphrase. And and what I'd like to think of is that three quarters of since you're dealing with so many conditions that are existing, that the solution is already three quarters there, that you're already dealing with aspects of how the building is sitting on the land, especially in urban, where you have design constraints where the street is or where the sunshine is or the scale of the house or the budget of the house, all these design constraints are already there. And so what a good designer is somebody who is very adept at creating uh, good housing or buildings in general, uh, uh, use, basically synthesizes those constraints. And so that's what that means. How did you get to that number of three quarters? Is that just a rough guess or... Yeah, yeah, I took a scientific survey, of course. No, it's it's totally made up, <laughs> but it can be between 90% to 50%. Like if I'm out in the wilderness, I may have less design constraints than I'm in an urban area. But at the same time, if I put, if I add design constraints like passive house or materiality or things like that, then I'm adding to that design constraint pile, so to speak. And that, at least for me, for talking with so many architects in the book, they flourish in those conditions. That that's where, just like many artists or other uh, creative types work, they design, they work best under constraints. How do they identify these constraints? Or is this simple? Is this difficult? Does it take years of experience? I don't know. I think it's a very personal process. I think it's a process of adapting and you're bringing both your your own personality into the process as well as being very aware of your conditions surrounding you. So it's in that way, that's why you can't just copy one building from one place to another because you also have different people who have different uh, insights. But in the end, it's still about sensitivity and problem solving. So uh, even though you might have two the same conditions and two different people designing it, and they come up with different, very different solutions. Those solutions are still can be just as adept at uh, being uh, viable places to live. So that's interesting. Are you saying to me that let's say this three quarters designed, but two different architects could come up with something completely different? Yeah, that's right. And so you can look at you can look at the underlying factors. Like if I said I want a certified passive house and I want it to fit this type of program. The buildings themselves on the surface can look very different and even have different ways you use the building, but underneath they still are solving the same problems. So it's sort of like, you know, you have a palette of paints and it's just how you combine those colors, for instance, to put it roughly. Let's talk about some of the other aspects then, because I know expectations is, is one that can muddy the water, isn't it? I think it always becomes a partnership. The client, that that relationship is the beginning of that integrative design process. So everybody wants to be happy in the end. And I, you know, when I was thinking about this, I was I was understanding that what what really works well is when you have a client who has a big idea rather than lots of little ideas, because the those little ideas can contradict each other really quickly and it becomes very expensive and convoluted. But a couple of good, clear, big ideas really guides the process. And often that's from the client coming in, not so much the architect who who provides that. Can you give me an example then? I don't know whether you can draw anything from the book just off the top of your head. Sure. I'd say uh, like materiality for me personally, like for my passive house, uh, this is not the book, but I'll, I can get to how it works in the book, I, I decided to have no foam in my building just as a design constraint. And uh, that that really guided so many other decisions going down the path. And in the book, I go up to uh, the Cascadia region, which is northern Pacific Northwest, and look at materiality through uh, timber and heavy timber and how that guides design there, especially for larger projects that are popping up all over the place. 
And that becomes really a core, just the fabric of the building becomes the core driving design element for so many other things to happen inside the building from finishes to structural, to safety, to uh, you name it. I actually find it quite a difficult area to understand materials. I'm, I'm hoping when my own project finally gets there, I'll have more of a sense of it. But it really does seem difficult to know if you want something that is sustainable, you don't want your foam or anything like that. There's a lot of marketing blurb to get through and you're never really sure whether one product is that much better than another. Yeah, I find materiality really interesting too because when I first started this path, I thought sustainability was about materials for the longest time. So going to the trade shows and everything, it was all about materials, materials, materials. And then somehow that kind of disappeared for a number of years in my mind. And then materials is coming back in a big way in the way I'm looking at at how design works. And it is is so many options out there that it's it becomes overwhelming. And there's so many contradictions because you know, you're right at the front edge of a big sales push. So how do you know what works or not? And I think you have to really, that's experience, but it's also something that's very tactile, which is very rich. So going in and just experiencing and looking at materials and how they're used and utilized is, is a lot of fun as well. So I think for owners, it's a good opportunity to learn you started talking about your project and then I pulled you away from that <laughs> a little bit. So let's go back. You've got your original. Did you build that first one that you went off grid or were you just going off grid in the building that was already there? It was a, it was a funky little cabin. It was, it was kind of the edge of the tiny house thing. Uh, I think it was about 40 square meters in it and it was off grid. And when I first moved in, I was just re- reminiscing that, uh, First thing that happened was the plumbing froze because I'm in Colorado and then the uh, homemade compost toilet backed up. And then what else happened? The solar system failed. So (laughs) we started kind of from scratch at that point. So that's where I started really having to learn how to build. That's another aspect, I think, of Passive House, that that simplicity that you're hoping that the only possible thing that could not work would be the MVHR and then it would be just a very simple fan to fix. It might be really ingrained in me to have so many systems fail so quickly that, yeah, that the complexity and kind of doing a lot of things not very well was not a really good way. When I started from scratch in the same plot of land, which I knew very well at this point, was to really take a completely opposite track. And Passive House was certainly that. That was a guiding principle of this that was going to, like you were saying before, you pick a couple of very core elements of what you want your project to be. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then, and then also because I lived uh, here for a while, I also had a sense of the land and then trying to integrate a building really elegantly into the space was a wonderful challenge. And I learned a lot from uh, the process of research from the book on how to approach that problem. I'm thinking that having lived there for such a long time, will that give you an ultimate edge almost over an architect? It must be very difficult for them. They just have to interpret the situation looking at it, whereas living on the site, I've wondered about doing that almost as a way to help ease the finances to just get the uh, lot that I'm looking at and then stay there for a while and then move on with the bill. But you must have taken in entirely how the sun comes up, all of, all of these sorts of things, how the how things go on there. You know, it's true, but at the same time, I think an architect who does this all the time for a living, being a non-professional designer, obviously I have a lot of background in it, but at the same time, the solution for me was time. Absolutely, that that through the A, living in the space and taking my time and building and designing the space as I went along, uh, it's very bespoke. So it gave me opportunities to do kind of a richer palette of materials and design decisions. And I'm fairly happy with it went, but the key was because I had a lot of time to make those decisions. And when I see these really top-notch architects go in and develop projects, it's I'm fascinated at how rich and how detailed they are in a relatively short amount of time. So that's really the biggest difference between, I think, a non-professional and a professional is, is that time element in keeping your mind open. So fill in some of the details here. We're thinking about your house. We know that it's nearly complete now. So how did that whole journey go? How long have you been at it? 
Yeah, I think we started about four years ago on the design phase. And it was just a, it's a guest house for a family from around the country. And my sister has two children. They live uh, abroad. So it's a place for them to stay. So programmically, I was also a friend of mine's child also has MS. So I was thinking about how do you uh, bring a wheelchair down to the space, for instance, or if my parents get older, how do they use the space? So I wanted to make it based on more universal design principles. Uh, certainly, I talked about the no foam deal. So that uh, that certainly became living in the mountains. I just couldn't imagine bringing up a truckloads of plastics, for instance. That just was counterintuitive to me. And you talked with Bjorn Kiroff about that in one of your podcasts and how he was influenced by cradle to cradle as I was. Can you explain a little bit more about that? I know that uh, that one we were really interested in the the natural materials, but cradle to cradle, I don't recognize that phrase. I must have forgotten that in between this and when I did the interview. So, yeah. So your homework assignment after this is to buy the book <laughs> Cradle to Cradle oh, uh, by William McDonald, Michael B- Bogart, Bogart. And it's um, I probably mispronounced his name. And uh, it's really the seminal book on materiality. And he's an architect. So, so they start a lot with building design, but also uh, fabrics and, and all the things that we consume is usually based on a cradle to grave model where we take it from the environment, we synthesize it, we consume it, and then we throw it away into usually a landfill or burn it or something like that. And the cradle, in chemically speaking, that's a, that's a dead end. But his their concept is that you take a material from its raw form and then you uh, use it, and he calls it a use cycle rather than a life cycle because what happens is that it's it can be uh, reclaimed into two forms. It can be reclaimed. If it's a natural material, it can it can be reinserted into the environment again. Or if it's what he calls a technical nutrient, say plastics or metals or other synth- synthetic materials, that you're able to fully re, uh, reclaim it and recycle it and turn it into a new product. In fact, uh, they go a little bit further in their second book and they call it upcycling, where you're constantly improving the nature of the materials each time you reuse them. So it's a multi-generational mindset. I think it's a whole economy thing as well, though. When you've started talking through that, I was going, yes, yeah, this this just has to happen, hasn't it? It's a logical conclusion. It's true. And just across the water from you, the Dutch are really working on uh, circular economy concepts. Yeah, yeah, that is another really, that's a, there's a podcast in there and all sorts. Okay, let's get back to the project. How far through? We, we got a bit of a brief from you. So how did you go on from there? So what we did was, you know, existing conditions. I had a slope. I had some good solar potential. So what I did was, the first thing was, uh, I didn't want a box. So I actually took a shed type roof and then sliced the front about 10 degrees, which gave me better solar access. It also gave an interesting shape to the building. So that was fun. But what I was really inspired by um, was that I was sitting at a uh, a Japanese spa, strangely enough, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I was looking at the buildings and I noticed that the buildings were built around the trees. And I thought, well, that's that's brilliant. I have all these trees right there on the lot. So how why don't I just make the house kind of sneak in between the trees and then I can use the trees in the front of the building as my shading for the passive house. So that also really informed the shape of the space, uh, informed, of course, how uh, the passive house model works, but also kept made it feel that it was much more integrated into the landscape rather than shaping the landscape to fill for the needs of the building itself. This whole episode has been on restraints, so I guess we should identify them on your project so we can see how this is all pieced together. Ah, uh, Yeah. So that might have been one of them, but are there, are there any others? Uh, something, I mean, you, there's other things that inspire me uh, besides restraints. Well, restraints, I mean. Okay, here's a good question then. You know, restraints versus inspiration, where, where do you sort of meet in the middle? I think they start becoming the same thing. After a while, they start mixing together. And that's when you really are hitting it. Uh, I was talking with, a, I'm starting a podcast series uh, called Arc Change with a um, architect down in Santa Fe, Jonah Stanford. And we're talking about how sometimes you're pushing and you're pushing and you can't quite make it happen. The design feels off that you're kind of, 
you're you're making the design, you're pushing the design to places where it doesn't seem to naturally go. And that's when you're finding out that your strengths aren't working for you. And then when you go back, he's, and he was talking about when you go back and you look at the original intention and then just start looking at how things are going together in a, in a different way, you can find flow where those restraints actually have pointed you to what the opportunities of the building are going to be and what they have to be. So those restraints are actually the the way of signaling to you if the building is being properly designed or not. Quick podcast question. Well, you've mentioned it there. I listened to that first one and you were out and about a, a lot. I, I quite like that. So do you look at a lot of buildings on this podcast? I know it's obviously audio, but... I don't, you know, we, we're just shaping it out. This is our first thing uh, when we're forming out the idea of with a podcast. I grabbed our mic and we went over to uh, Site Santa Fe to to talk about the design of this contemporary space that a famous architecture firm is working on. And we're going to see where it's going to go. There's a lot of um, lessons learned. I think it's going to be the biggest principle. And a lot of those lessons learned are about how incorporating passive house into design and both from a technical, aesthetic, functional point of views, because we both obviously have experience from that. So we want to delve into that. And then I think I want to bring in some of the larger aspects of, of building design in general. And Joan is very interested in that as well. So uh, it's going to be evolving. And I think we'd love to hear what people also want to know more of and, and start researching and responding to that. So I think an evolving podcast is the way forwards because it's an odd thing when you set up a podcast that you don't normally, unless you run it in seasons, you don't normally have an end. So you set up a podcast and it goes on forever. <laughs> so you need it to evolve. <laughs> you, right. do, you do. And you found you, and I think you did it, the magic thing is that it's focused, but still a massive topic. Yeah. You can touch on anything. So it's yeah. really I feel I'm never going to run out of material. And I imagine it's the, the same for you. Also, if you're passionate on a subject, you just know, and particularly when there are so many people who uh, are choosing the, the cheapest route or just making money out of buildings and stuff um you know there's the world to put to rights too but ben you also have a great voice for podcasting so oh thank you i think you've got a pretty good voice here let's let's pat each other's back while we're at it look we're (laughs) gonna run out of time if we're not careful here so just a couple more questions on the building and what have you learned going through it Uh, i suppose we haven't even really talked about what the i'm assuming it's timber frame is it yeah, it's a timber frame building. It's it's timber frame, cellulose insulation, and mineral wool insulation. The secret was uh, to put the foundation using a crawl space, so I didn't have to have any foams down there. Pretty basic house in a lot of ways. The thing that's still the form factor is still fairly simple, but it's interesting just because of playing around with the wedge shape, and also the wedge shape was based on playing with the idea of cabins, and we also have a. a very unique mountains out here called hogbacks, which are very architectural shaped spaces. So, so the building plays with form quite a bit while keeping it simple. So for the design constraint passive house, it actually really helped guide the process of designing that. And you have to live next door to this now. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I wrote my, I wrote my book in it. It was fantastic space. And I don't even have a functioning heating system in it yet in the middle of winter. It's, oh, right. Okay. It was hell of a How test. close to the end are you then? Uh, we're just finishing up the kitchen now and I should be done hopefully in a month or so. Now, I don't know whether it's a much smaller uh, property because you said the other one was a cabin, but you're not tempted to do a switch so that you come in here and your guests can go and stay in the old house. It might just be like the podcast. You never know which how you're going to go with it. So, yeah. Well, that Andrew, I've really enjoyed having a chat with you today. Thank you very much for coming on. And I know you've got loads more to share. Perhaps catch up another time if you fancy it. Yeah, that'd be great fun. I love listening to your podcast, especially the Harold Orr's uh, conversation. So, yeah, thanks for putting building science up front and center like this. He is a legend. It's always easy podcasts like that because when someone's achieved so much and I was just pleased that he was able to talk to me and it was one of those things that it happened very quickly. I wasn't thinking about doing it. I got the opportunity. So yeah, that was just a pure pleasure. But um, yeah, Andrew, thank you very much. Great. Cheers. Thank you. 
Head online to take a look at the show notes for this one, houseplanninghelp.com slash 125. You can review the key points. We've got some photos of Andrew's current project. And if you want to take a look at the book, we'll link you across to Amazon. The book is called Hyper Localization of Architecture. Once again, houseplanninghelp.com slash 125. Just concluding today with a look at the hub, and this is particularly for you if you're someone who's sitting on the fence, you're not sure whether this is right for you. Well, it's right for you if you're trying to build a house. It's even better if you're based in the UK because we do have quite a bit of UK detail. However, if you're retrofitting or if you're somewhere else in the world, it's probably a lot of value. And I say that because one of the focuses is the case studies. And the reason being, I run a production company, so of course, video is my superpower. And I think we can make some very clear videos. What we're trying to do is to map out the decision process that Alex, for example, because he's our first case study, building Long Barrow with insulated concrete formwork, just to see why he decided to do this and not that. And the more of these that we put into the hub, hopefully it's going to give you a sense of what's going to happen when you get to your build and some of what you're going to face. Well, that's the idea behind it anyway. We're also adding new modules every month, just trying to tie together information, make it really easy to understand, logical sequence, best practice. We'll update these things too, as and when we need to. And then there's the community side. We've got a Facebook group and it's really good. Everyone pitching in with what's happening with their current project. Perhaps a bit of accountability. I I maybe didn't set it up for this reason, but that's definitely going on how people are moving on, what they're researching and so forth. So it's been £45 for the entire year. That is the case, so long as you're not listening after the 30th of April 2016. So as I publish this episode, 10 days left to get it at that price, £45 a year. We've really been operating in a beta mode because we know that things haven't been perfect and we've been trying to sort it all out. I'm quite happy now. I think we're up to a good level and I'm confident that you're going to get value from it if you become a member. So the price will increase to £99 a year from the 1st of May. Get in now. Remember, it's a lock-in price too. If you get in at £45 a year, as long as you continue to stay a member, you'll be paying that for the years to come. Houseplanninghelp.com slash hub. And one other thing I will say, perhaps you're, oh, I don't know, should I be doing this? Is it right for me? Well, still, if you haven't been through our free module on finding land, then I'd recommend you do that. So I'll give you a slightly different URL, houseplanninghelp.com slash land. That's me done for another episode. Thanks for listening. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.